imagine. Imagine a single candle placed outside on a table in your garden. The air is still. The candle is burning steadily. Then a breeze sweeps across your garden and it extinguishes the flame. The candle has blown out. Now imagine that candle has been relit, but this time it's placed inside a protective lantern. The breeze continues to sweep across the garden, but the flame remains unaffected. However, the flame doesn't get any worse, but doesn't get any better. Finally, imagine. Imagine you create a fire pit in your garden. You bring together light kindling and logs to start the fire burning. Then suddenly, a little disruption, a little disorder. The weather changes. The breeze turns into a gentle wind. The wind stokes the flames. The flames grow and spread. And suddenly, suddenly the fire pit roars into life, bringing light and warmth into your garden. The candle was fragile. It was affected by the smallest variances in the environment. When placed inside the lantern, however, it was made robust. It was unaffected, but it didn't get any better. In contrast, the fire pit is a representation of what Nassim Taleb calls anti-fragile. In the case of the fire pit, the flames responded to the unpredictable disorder in the weather, the wind and the swirling leaves, accelerating and intensifying the flames. How can we be more like the fire pit and less like the candle? Anti-fragility is beyond robustness and resilience. resilience the resilient res resists stress, the anti-fragile gets better. All these elements that we traditionally think as threats or risks, uncertainty, volatility, disruption, disorder, stress, these are at the heart of fostering anti-fragile systems. Examples of these systems can be found everywhere. Take the classic case of reproductive fitness, the challenges and the disorder in the ecosystem and the environment force species to adapt to survive. How about our muscles when we go to the gym it tears, but then grows stronger. What about our yearly flu jab? Our immune systems react and respond and grow stronger. Even as something as simple as a recipe can benefit from a little disruption and a little change. I take one of my mum's traditional recipes, classic example of fried rice, which she was horrified to find my stepdad adding Tabasco sauce to. I can assure you, though, after that initial stress, we were all pretty impressed by the end result, except perhaps my mother. When you peel back the surface, you will see that anti-fragility underpins many of the things that grow and evolve and change around us. From a simple idea, to technology advancement, to our culture, to our society, to political systems, to our revolutions. But why does this matter? It matters because disorder, disruption, uncertainty, these are the realities of the world that we live in today that we cannot change. If this was ever in doubt, we've certainly seen it prove this year. The world is staring down one of the most disruptive events of living memory when a virus that seemed like a blip on the other side of the planet has spread and disrupted the lives of almost everyone on it. We've seen the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives. We've seen employment and commerce take a hit, leaving many in financial hardship. Mental health has become a key concern, many plagued by loneliness and some shackled with anxiety. The way we work, the way we socialize, the way we define communities and societies, these have all been disrupted and changed. But do we have to ask ourselves the hard questions to understand where we were fragile, where our systems and societies were fragile? To understand how we might need to adapt to thrive into the future? Did we learn from each other, other countries, our past, our history? Did we have our blinkers on for too long to some of our major flaws and mistakes? 
Did we create systems that were so dependent on one another that as soon as one collapsed, so did the rest? We are entering an era that faces profound challenges in a world with increasing uncertainty and volatility. This world is becoming increasingly complex. If we want to do more than just survive in these times, if we want to thrive in these times, we cannot simply extend on the old business as usual. We need a new approach. Anti-fragility gives us that hope by helping us understand and embracing and thriving from the realities around us. Because we cannot ignore these realities of our world as much as we might like to, as much as we might be hardwired to. But it's something that can be unlearned. By choosing not to reject disorder, by choosing to embrace it, we can not only learn to live with it, we can learn to thrive on it. But where do we start? Where do we start so we can create anti-fragile societies and worlds and systems around us? It starts with us as individuals, fostering, unlearning, creating our own anti-fragility. So I want to share with you just three thoughts, three strategies that can help us build more anti-fragility into our lives and ourselves. First, don't put all your eggs in one basket or in corporate terms, diversify. The classic case from a business sense is how you can diversify your income sources. The more income sources you have, the less an individual stressor, such as a change to one industry, will affect your overall position. This is true too for us in our careers. How can you create different options, different career potential opportunities that you can have? How do you diversify your skill sets? As they say, a jack of all trades is a master of none. But if we limit our skills too narrowly, we might find it challenging to overcome a setback or unexpected job loss. As industries respond further to the events of 2020, the importance of diversification of skill sets have been brought into sharper focus. Diversify. Two. Avoid a house of cards situation with modularity. We need to build modularity into our lives, keeping the elements of our lives interconnected, but integral within their own right. This means that if we have to pivot, if we have to adjust, if we have to refocus one part of our life, we can limit the impacts and the consequences to that part. It's like a game of Jenga. You want to be able to pull out one block without the entire tower crashing down. Recent studies have looked at the phenomena of burnout, the affliction that leads many high-performing individuals to break down from the stress of their work. Recent studies involving doctors suggest that doctors who engage regularly in hobbies outside their work are at lower risk of this burnout. In this example, when we can separate our sense of self-worth, when we can separate our sense of purpose, of meaning, from our work, we put less pressure on that part of our life. We put less pressure on our life going right in our workplace. So we can be more adaptable when challenges are thrown at us. So how can you create different sources of meaning, of purpose, of enjoyment and of happiness in your life? How can you also create different circles of friends, different networks of friends? How can you create parts of your lives slightly separate that you can actually experiment, iterate, push boundaries on and start to, to test and adapt? Modularity. Third and finally, don't be afraid of failure, but Remember to reflect and learn from it. Fail fast, fail forward, so the saying goes. Just as we are hardwired to avoid uncertainty and disorder, so too are we hardwired to avoid failure. It leads to shame, it leads to denial. Perhaps it even leads to attempts to sweep our shortfalls under the rug. We often come to these types of talks to hear about focusing on the positive, 
focusing on what's working. But in reality, failure is not just inevitable, it is one of our best learning opportunities. The weakest links in our lives are our best feedback loops. Let's take coffee as an example. How many of you drink too much coffee in a day? One at 6 a.m., perhaps one at 10 a.m., maybe the 3 p.m. slump and we have a third, maybe a fourth. And when we get that caffeine high, we can be tempted to think that the problem is solved. But if you pause, dig a little deeper, we can start to realize that the real problem, the tiredness at the start of the day that continues and continues, the real problem is due to a whole range of other contributing factors in our life. And actually, that short-term fix of caffeine might actually be exacerbating the problem. So don't forget to focus on failure. Remember that great quote by Thomas Edison as he tried and failed over and over in his relentless efforts to invent the light bulb. He said, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. By focusing on these failures, we can start to learn the parts of our lives that are more fragile, parts of that our lives that we can adapt and iterate. So ask yourself those hard questions. Why did I make that decision? How did I feel? What worked? What didn't? Why? How did it affect other parts of my life? How did other parts of my life affect it? By reflecting and learning, we are able to make sense of the feedback loops around us and start to understand how we can build anti-fragility, how we can build adaptivity, how we can build agility into ourselves and our lives. Because ultimately, that is the point of anti-fragility. Understanding, making sense, responding, and adapting to the world around us in a way that allows us to thrive. It's about challenging the natural tendency to think that more resilience, more robustness, more avoidance is the answer, that building harder internal walls will protect us from the elements. We come to these talks and we hear about overcoming uncertainty. We hear about focusing on what's going well, focusing on the positive. And with good reason, too much stress, too much uncertainty, it can tip us over the edge. But in a world where these are our realities, we put ourselves at a disadvantage to ignore these truths. So maybe we need to change the dialogue. Maybe we need to embrace uncertainty. Maybe we need to invite some disruption. Maybe we need to crave disorder so that we can learn to flex that muscle, build that agility, become anti-fragile, so we can learn to thrive into the future. Because what happens if we can turn our individual fears into something that we can harness for positive change for our society? We can transform that single candle into a roaring fire pit that just burns brighter and brighter the more you throw at it. Thank you.